Today's video is brought to you by my fantastic patrons. Pledge today for exclusive perks, including two day early access. Link in the description. What the devil is that noise? Luke? 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 Damn, I sure do love Thomas and the Magic Ro- ah! Fuck! Oh, look how they massacred my boy. <sighs> Don't you ever do that again. Hey, don't get blackout drunk on my coach, how about? I'm not- I'm not drunk, alright? This is schl- huh? Ow! No, seriously, get the hickety heck off my express. The audience is waiting. No, I don't want to review Series 10. Dude, come on. It's been 84 years since you looked at Series 9. You owe it to the people. Also, if you let Unlucky Tug pass you now, they're going to start calling you a hack, so... Ugh, fine. Where are we anyway? Where does this train go? Uh... Holy fuck! <coughs> ah, this wasn't on the itinerary. Why, why is everything on fire? <coughs> Hold up, let me just... Uh... Oh, spaghetti. Get back on the fucking coach! <sighs> Come on, it could be worse. Ah, who am I kidding? No, it couldn't. Uh, how do we get home? Don't worry, I've seen this before. You've seen this before? Eleven times, as a matter of fact. And if it's anything like the last three, I know exactly what to do. Now just stay still for a minute, there might be some momentary discomfort. Wait, 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 you gonna- <gasps> You. Just get on with it! Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. <sighs> I don't know guys, I don't know where to begin with this. Yeah, we've made it to series 10, the first double digit series. But for what should be a big bang, it couldn't even disturb a game of chess played by church mice. In terms of production history, the only noteworthy thing to add is that Edward, Henry, Gordon and James's Perspex models that have been used since 1984 were finally retired in favour of new models made from brass, joining Thomas and Percy's brass models from the previous series. I think... I think they were changed last series? I, I couldn't tell you. And if you couldn't tell by their paintwork, man oh man can you tell by their faces at certain points. The Sodor Airport from Calling All Engines came back after being absent in Series 9. We got some new characters including Jeremy the Jetplane and Fearless Freddy. And eventual mainstays to the series, Rosie and Rocky the Crane made their debut in this series as well. Also, Sandal came back. I know it was because he didn't have a bigger scale model built for him immediately after Series 4, but does anyone have any reason as to why he was absent? Sir Handel had been naughty. Eh, probably. For the first time ever, the series had two additional episodes, making Series 10 the longest of the model era with a total of 28 episodes when it first aired in 2006. This episode amount would only be done once more years later with Series 20 in 2016. We got Simon, Steve, Rob, Scouse, Michael, Yeehaw! Michael, yada yada yada, the same team as before. Only now with more story contributions from Sharon Miller! Whoop de doo. I have barely any memories of this series because this was it. This was when I first stepped away from Thomas the Tank Engine as a kid. It just didn't hit the same way it used to, and I felt embarrassed to like it. I'm sorry for being so negative right off the bat, but I figured I might as well start with the gloves off. Get the fuck off! This is the worst of the hit era to me, and is one of the worst Thomas and Friends series I have ever seen. Going into this, I knew this was going to be a low point, but now that I have watched all of Series 10, I'm going to skim on a lot of details regarding its problems carried over from Series 8 and 9, in order to talk about the stuff that really sucked, 
but also be somewhat fair regarding the good stuff. Because despite how I feel about the overall package, there are still some things I like about it. Lastly, all this is just my opinion. If you enjoy Series 10 and perhaps consider it to be the best of the hit era, that's perfectly fine. More power to you. Don't let my feelings towards something you love soil them. That's what makes you who you are. Anyway, shall we begin? Well guys, this is it. This is where the three strikes and you're out formula truly started to become an issue in Thomas and Friends. Series 8 and 9 had a few stories with this formula, but they were never that big of an issue yet. Hell, sometimes they resulted in some genuinely good episodes. But in Series 10, we are now deep up to our chins into this era of this story structure. You all know this formula, and you have all heard every Thomas fan under the sun talk about why it's awful until the cows come home. So I'm not going to waste your time going over ones like the green controller, Toby's afternoon off, seeing the sights, and we have Sodor's Legend of the Lost Treasure at home, because they don't bother me as much. Instead, I want to talk about the ones that really stuck out like a sore thumb the most, like the sorest of thumbs. My first red flag was episode one, Follow That Flower. So Thomas is jealous of James for getting to take a truck of flour to make cakes and bread for a harvest festival. So his idea is to hide the truck from James. Um, mate, couldn't you just take the truck to the bakery now while James is elsewhere? It'd be shitty behaviour, but clearly you don't care. Go for it! Stop dicking around the wharf! James follows him because Thomas biffed the truck too hard, and it's leaking flour everywhere. I've given up getting annoyed at how food is transported on Sodor, by the way. Thomas can't see the trail he's leaving behind him. That's fair, he can't turn his head 180 degrees. But the third time James finds him, he is reversed into a shed, and the long trail of flour is right there in the open. And he still gets shocked when he sees it? What? <coughs> <coughs> Jesus. Now it's amending mistakes time. He goes to the flour mill. He and James have to work together to get the last truck of flour right from the back, even though it looks like they just have to move that one line in the middle. And everything is all hunky-dory in the end with the festival. Yay. If you're wondering why this was mostly filmed at the wharf with the big scale Thomas and James, because the wharf is a new set and needs to be promoted, nothing else. Merchandising! Jesus Christ, that looks terrifying. <laughs> Topped off Thomas, what an awful concept for a Thomas story. Ideal for this era for sure, but not what we come to expect from the franchise. So Thomas tries racing the returning Spencer to the station, and projects a gust of wind so strong it blows the Fat Controller's hat away. He can't go to the special tea without it, so rather than going back and getting a spare one, Thomas sets out to get his hat back. <sighs> Imagine if in Edward Gordon and Henry in Series 1, after the Fat Controller's hat blew off into a goat's field, they reached the next station only to go back and get it. That's what it feels like here. It's a lost cause, mate. Just get a new one. So after the three failed attempts to retrieve the hat because the wind is so bloody problematic in England, I mean, they're not wrong, Thomas... <sighs> apologises to the wind for thinking he can go faster than it and asks it for help. Please, can you help me? The wind heard Thomas. The wind is a sentient character now. God, now I'm imagining if the wind was alive since the classic era. Hush, Dougie. I can hear something. Probably Mr. Wind. What? Hello, Mr. Wind. Great to hear you again. Who are you talking to? We're looking for a wee blue tank engine in the snow. Yeah, haven't you seen one, have you? Dougie! There's no one there. Oh, there is. It's Mr. Wind. W why do you call it Mr. Wind? Because that's his name, Donny. And I didn't appreciate you calling him it. How? How do you know that? He told me when we first met. You speak to the wind. Okay. I hear Mr. Wind's voice every day. Oh, surely you do. He tells me to burn everyone and everything. What? Aye, burn it all. Wipe the slate clean, rain hellfire across the land beyond what the eye can see. To leave what? nothing but the lifeless ashes and smoke of what once was. 
for life to begin anew with no knowledge of what society existed prior. Douglas, you're scaring me. Break the cycle of life we're all stuck in, making the same mistakes and working the same pointless jobs over and over and over again as we travel for what feels like a thousand miles only to go nowhere. When the day of destiny arrives, we must face our fate as the weak perish and the strong survive to nurture the newborns into greater beings, rid the world of its sins and sinners, axles to axles, rust to rust, the glorious rebirth of planet Earth! Get me the fuck out of this room. Oh, there's Thomas. Come on, the poor wee engine must be frozen to the frames in there. Speaking of snow, if you know Series 10, you'll already have a fair idea as to which of the Three Strikes episodes is the absolute worst. Oh yeah, Thomas's frosty friend. In this episode, Thomas sees a giant snowman, and despite how unnaturally round the snowman is, and how fake the accessories look, he believes it to be made of snow. He heads off on his way, only for the snowman to be revealed to us, the audience, as a balloon. It breaks loose and attaches itself to Thomas's back buffers as he goes along his merry way. Not only does Thomas fail to see the ropes below the snowman floating in front of him, because if Follow That Flower has taught us anything, he's incapable of looking downwards, but we have not one, not two, not three, not four, but five instances where Thomas looks up at the snowman and thinks he is both alive and following him. Mr. Snowman, I told you to go back to the children. Why are you still following me? Just, uh, how? How can your character have an IQ that I am convinced begins with a decimal point to believe this, yet is the voice of reason in other stories? Just how? Please, for the love of God, tell me. I, I am certain this is a cold take. Ah, cold, because it's a snowman. But this is the worst episode of the series so far, by a long shot. Your special prize should be yellow fucking snow. God, and these episodes weren't the only letdown about this series. I, I kid you not, I went into this already setting the bar very low because I knew which episodes were going to be stinkers. But series 10 managed to completely exhaust me with how monotonously slow the overall experience is. Up to this point, we've had the morals of these stories become more and more obvious. We are 10 series in, and we're now at a point, or at the very least, I am, where the messages they're trying to tell us are so obvious from the start, but the episodes just continue to play out as normal. Oh look, Rusty told the workmen to hurry up with the signposts. I hope this doesn't come back to bite him. Well, would you look at that. Gee, Percy abandons his own work delivering coal to try and take part in helping with the carnival. I wonder if he will learn that delivering coal is beneficial to the carnival. Well, who'd have fucking guessed it? Oh no, Thomas keeps leaving visitors behind in an attempt to be as fast as Gordon. Could it be that he will learn not to be impatient and appreciate the time spent in one place? Well, would you, Adam and Eve it? The pacing of these stories is at an all-time low. It doesn't apply to every story in series 10, mind you, but it applies to enough that watching them one after the other is an absolute drag. Sitting there the whole time thinking, just get to the bloody point, please. <sighs> okay, I think that just about covers the standard Hetera complaints. Let's move on to specifics. Thomas and the Colours, which I swear sounds like an alternate name for that one fan story where Thomas accidentally inhales drugs through his firebox, is an episode that really confuses me. It doesn't make me angry, it just leaves me befuddled. Thomas is jealous over James getting to pull a train of the Sodor's school football team and tries to talk his way into changing James's mind. It doesn't work, so he sabotages James' journey by asking a signalman to change the points, diverting James onto a track that is overgrown with tree branches and bushes, which causes the flags he's decorated with to be scratched and ripped to pieces. Thomas goes to get help and finds Bertie broken down, who was taking the children to the football match. Bertie was taking the children to the football match. Right, if Bertie was taking the children, why is James going to the football field? To take them home after the match? 
If Bertie's taking them, why isn't he dressed up in flags and whatnot? So then Thomas gets Annie and Clarabelle to take the children to James rather than to the match, so they can decorate him. But then, James doesn't even get to take them to the match either, because he turns up to the match decorated and the children are already there. He's not pulling any coaches, Thomas is. Wait, does that mean that Thomas took the kids to decorate James, left James to take them to the match, came back for James and then arrived back at the field again? I don't understand. Clearly there must have been some miscommunication behind the scenes where the script wasn't properly translated to camera. Which seems to be another flaw in series 10 where the stories must have made sense in the reading session but didn't make as much sense when they were actually filmed. Take Thomas and the Shooting Star for example, where Thomas gets lost in the woods trying to find the power station during a power cut. It not only doesn't make sense for a steam engine to be lost because if he's confused going forwards then he could just go backwards to the junction he turned off at. That is how rails work. But also when he finally gives up, wishing he can see where to go, the Shooting Star appears lighting up the sky and the power station just so happens to be right in front of him. My guess is, in storyboarding or reading the script, there was meant to be more of an implied distance between Thomas and the power station, like he's up on a hill and sees it just in the distance thanks to the shooting star, but they probably had to keep the set for the station flat, so Thomas looks kinda stupid not seeing the silhouette of the power station right there. Side note, thinking about it, that shooting star must have been the clearest star in the sky that night, because all of Sodor's power was out, so no light pollution means that the shooting star really did light up the whole island, showing Thomas where to go. A pretty interesting, if unintentional, message about light pollution there. I wonder who wrote this? Oh. Okie dokie, let's try and raise the spirits by talking about the good episodes, because there are still some in this that I enjoy, even if they do come with an asterisk. It's Good To Be Gordon shows Gordon at his most humble. After he feels bad taking Henry's special coal before going out to set his new speed record with the Express, he gives up his pursuit of the record right at the very end in order to go back and help Henry after seeing him so unwell. At no point is Gordon grumpy or boastful throughout this episode, which is a first for the hit era and a rarity for the model series in general. It's wholesome to see him put Henry first, you're going to be late, cried his driver. I don't care, whistled Gordon, and he started to reverse. Their big brotherly bond is very strong in this episode. I know a lot of you were expecting me to hate this story because of the retcon with Henry needing special coal again, and yeah, that is the biggest issue I have with this story. But it doesn't bother me as much as, let's say, Henry needing special coal in Thomas and the Magic Railroad. And I'm collecting one, two, three, four, five, six trucks of special Island of Sodor coal for you. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Special coal will make me feel <coughs> much better. If it's used to tell a good story, which this episode is, I don't mind the retcon as near and dear to my heart as Henry's special coal trilogy is. The episode even ends on a genuinely funny moment as Gordon arrives late as a result of helping Henry, losing out on setting a new speed record, but then he remembers who has the old one. Who holds the old record? whistled Thomas. I do, said Gordon, and the good friends laughed. <laughs> That's legit funny. I wonder who wrote that? Oh fuck's sake, that's twice in a row now! Big Strong Henry, also a good episode showing the opposite side of Gordon and Henry's brotherly dynamic, with Gordon bragging about being the strongest and making Henry feel emasculated. So Thomas and Percy try their damnedest to help Henry feel better, showing him heavy trains to pull to show his strength. For any fans who hated seeing Thomas and Percy be so mean to unwell Henry in Series 7's What's the Matter with Henry, this must have been nice to see them trying to help him instead even if it results in Henry having an accident. But even then he proves his worth not in brawn, but with brains as he guides Gordon's runaway cows to their farm using hay on his flatbed. I think it's cool how they brought back the trope of Gordon and Henry facing trouble with cows, something we saw all the way back in series 2. Showing Henry, being the nature lover he is, understands how to help the animals back to their home, and Gordon is just very unfortunate. 
I also really liked Toby's new shed, where Thomas tries to surprise Toby with a brand new roof for his shed after seeing it has holes in it, only to realise Toby liked the old roof because the birds would make nests in his shed like it was their home too. It's a simple but effective moral of you may have the best of intentions to surprise someone by fixing something they have, but sometimes they have a reason for why it's broken, so it's important to ask first. This does become amended in the end, as Thomas asks the workman to use the wood from Toby's shed's old roof to build a birdhouse for outside the shed. That's very, very sweet. Those stories are diamonds in the rough, but they don't save the overall collection of 28 episodes, which is ungodly slow, repetitive, and very... stupid. There's no recurring themes, there's no bold story ideas, there's not even any spooky episodes. As for little things I noticed, I was going to give the green controller points for Percy's line about the fat controller losing his voice. Sir Topham is sick, she announced grandly. He has lost his voice. Percy was worried. I hope he finds it soon, he peeked. Until they kept repeating that joke until it wasn't funny anymore. The fat controller has lost his voice, puffed Percy. So I'm controller until he finds it. And I'm very pleased you found your voice. Ha ha ha. God almighty, what is that face? <laughs> he is pushing out a whopper, isn't he? <laughs> he is definitely shifting a big sturdy breakfast. <laughs> I noticed these grammar errors where they say Diesel's steam. Sorry, Toby, no time to talk. Mavis puffed, and she steamed past him. Rusty puffed on. And I noticed seeing the sights and Thomas and Scarlowy's big day out had the same ending with Thomas taking characters around the island, making a mistake, and then showing them the beach. Literally the same beach. There is probably a few more story things I could point out if I looked hard enough, but at this point, I just want to move on and talk about the characters. I don't know how else to transition. For new characters, we have Jeremy the Jet Plane. He's a jet plane, we also get Rocky the Crane and Rosie the Tank Engine, two characters who become mainstays in the not too distant switch to CGI. I've got nothing on Rosie here. She's an engine who really likes Thomas and copies everything he does and even follows him through a dangerous storm during one of his jobs, despite him getting visibly annoyed. She liked him so much that she wanted to be just like him. Was Thomas and Friends the beginning of simping? No! No! <laughs> Luke, please, let's not go there, okay? Oh, hey, Thomas Theorist, again. Uh, how did you get here? Well, uh, I hacked your computer. What? There is so much more to Rosie than you're implying, Luke. So I figured I'd take over for a second. I mean, sure, any excuse to take a break. All right, the mic is yours. Ah, brilliant. Thanks, man. Rosie is, uh, she's, uh, purple? Yeah, that's kind of what Rosie's personality is in a weird way. She's the colour purple. She's essentially this character that was designed for little girls, basically. So, to understand Rosie and why she exists in the Thomas universe, you first need to understand what gendered marketing is. So, uh, in marketing, there's this philosophy that if you make a product for both boys and girls, you'll only sell half as many items. So, let's say you are trying to sell a train character, for example, and it's a neutral gendered character, you'll only sell half the amount of characters, because what will happen is parents will come into a shop, and they will buy one train for their boy and their girl. They'll buy one train. But what happens in gender marketing is, if you sell a product that is both blue and pink, you'll sell double the amount of toys. Because parents will come into the shop and they'll buy the blue train, Thomas, for the boy, and they'll buy the pink train for their girls. 
this is the common thing, not just in children's marketing, but also in real life marketing for adults. Like for example, it's for men uh, deodorant or it's for women's shampoo. So like it's actually quite a common thing in gendered marketing. And so that's essentially where Rosie comes in. Rosie is basically the embodiment of this in that she is essentially a pink version of Thomas. Her whole existence is the fact that she's a pink train. To be a girl character, like, and she's pink, because, you know, you think of Thomas, Thomas is blue and he's marketed towards boys, and Rosie is pink and she's marketed towards girls. That's essentially where it comes from. And I'll guarantee you that uh, Rosie was definitely the favorite of a lot of young girls who got into Thomas. I mean, I know from personal experience, uh, having a sister, that her favorite character was Rosie. And so that's what Rosie essentially represents. She represents a... Uh, she is essentially the pink aisle. Like, you know when you go to an aisle in the shopping center and you see there's a blue aisle and there's a pink aisle and the boys generally unconsciously go to the, the boy aisle while the girls unconsciously go to the Barbie aisle. That's not to say you can't have people who shop across the aisle. I mean, I myself do that. That's, that's where Rosie essentially comes from. She's essentially a product <laughs> first, character second, you know? Um, and that's what I find so fascinating about her. And it's partly the reason why I want to make a female spin-off about her. Because I find it so interesting, you know, that she's essentially a female version of Thomas. As to regards Rosie in the actual series, I really like how Rosie is sort of like this younger sister to Thomas. She definitely has younger sister traits, where like Thomas will whistle and Thomas will move, and then Rosie will copy him. Very much akin to what a younger brother and sister dynamic would be like. So that's what their dynamic essentially is. They're essentially brother and sister dynamic, at least in Rosie's first appearance. She definitely walks a fine line between being a archetype and a stereotype. Like, you could definitely describe her as a stereotypical girl character, or you could describe her as an archetypal girl character. It really depends on how you look at it. A lot of Thomas fans would say, oh, we want more Rosie, we want more Rosie. Well, what essentially Thomas fans are asking when they ask that is that they're essentially wanting more femininity in Thomas because Rosie at her fundamental core is a feminine version of Thomas. That's what she essentially is. She's just a pink girl character to market towards girls to get them into Thomas. That's essentially what she is. And I can guarantee you that she's way more popular than other girl characters like Emily or uh, Daisy, for example. I mean, uh, I guess there's also Lady, whose name is literally Lady. Like, it couldn't be more obvious with Lady, you know? But I think the difference between Lady and Rosie is that Rosie is a young girl character, while Lady is an old girl character. And that's why I really wish that Rosie had been pushed more in the show, because I do feel like she could have served a very important role in the series. Like, she could have been the young sister girl character. And I feel like that would have really added a lot to the series, you know, not just as a other female character, but I think she would have had a really unique role in the show. She would have essentially functioned as the daughter role in the show, which w really wasn't a role. Like, you had Emily, who was the mother, and you had characters like Gordon, who was the father, or Thomas, who was like the son, and Percy, who was like the best friend. And it's just a shame to me that, you know, Rosie has kind of been cast aside. And also, just the whole red repaint Rosie as well, like, I just can't with that, you know? It's like, Rosie's whole existence was that she was a pink train character, and then you take away her fundamental thing. Like, that, what is there left to talk about with Rosie then? If you take away her fundamental thing, the only thing that defined Rosie was the fact that she was a girl, the fact that she was pink, and then they took that away from her. It's like, okay, well, what do you do with that then? And the answer was, they didn't do anything, because Rosie never had a lead role. Oh, I mean, besides dealing with relationships. Yeah, that's totally not sexist or anything. Isn't that a bit ironic? You know, they thought, oh yeah, Rosie, she's like this pink girl character, she's so sexist, we gotta change her. And then they change her, and then they give her an episode doing kissy faces with Thomas? Like, are you joking? Like, how on earth is that not being more stereotypical? Ugh, I hate it. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm ranting here a bit. Um, I think I might be the only person alive who could actually talk about Rosie for as long as I did. Don't be fooled, she's still the same old Rosie with the stupid red livery. She still embodies all the awful stereotypes she did before. But she's got a new livery. I want it, give it to me, I want it, I want it, give it to me, give it to me, I want it, I want it, give it to me. Anyway, Luke, back to you. Rocky is basically the breakdown train, but with a face. I guess the individual cranes weren't selling well enough in toy sales, so they put a smiley face on a crane and flippity floppity your money is their property. They kind of imply he's able to move when he offers to help Edward move some heavy pipes, and then much later when Edward comes to collect him in an emergency, Rocky has 
a whistle? I'm ready and waiting, Edward. But still has to be pulled by an engine. I think they just got mixed up. I guess Mr. Wind is also technically a character in this series, given he is addressed by the narrator. He's the Wind. Fearless Freddy, our next new engine for the narrow gauge railway. He's an engine who once ran on Sodor years ago and has only now returned after being away for years. I really like this character, even if the episode does cause some confusion regarding Sodor's history. He wants to hold on to his old name, Fearless Freddy, the fastest engine in the hills, and so races Skarloey and Reneus down the mountain, and he cheats by taking secret hidden tracks that only he knows. The old rocky way. He wished. No one would remember that now. Then Freddy remembered another old track. The craggy track. Puff Freddy, I know this railway like the back of my buffers. Why does Freddy know all these old tracks on the narrow gauge railway that Scarlowy and Reneus don't? Since they're supposed to be the oldest engines on the railway, in spite of what the episodes will tell you of course. Are they implying Freddy was part of the mid Sodor railway since he knows Sir Handel? If so, that still doesn't make sense, because that railway closed, and yet Freddy knows these tracks that should be new to him? Uh, I'm just completely lost. Speaking of Sir Handel, after a long hiatus since he was last seen in Series 4, our favourite blue number 3 narrow gauge engine is back on screen, complete with a new larger scaled model to match the rest of the fleet and boy oh boy do his faces hardly resemble his smaller gauge model at all. But that's not what bothers me about him. What does bother me is how he's portrayed. Back in series 4, and by extension the Railway series books, Sir Handel has always, always been a selfish, egocentric, rather childish character. His boasting was so pretentious, even Gordon was lost for words after meeting him for the first time. I'm Sir Handel. I've heard of you, you're an express engine. So am I, but I'm used to smart coaches, not these cattle trucks. Sorry, I can't stop, we must keep time, you know. Gordon was speechless. He was an irredeemable character, even worse than Duncan, who, at least when he made mistakes, eventually realised he was in the wrong and had a change of heart. Sir Handel was always an asshole and never changed his ways. Here, however, he's taken Skarloey and Reneus' role as the wise, responsible engine. It's literally a personality swap between them. He knows Freddy when the other engines don't. He never makes a mess as a result of being childish. He's the one Thomas looks to when trying to find the Christmas tree, and according to the writer's bible, he's very friendly and always gives 110%. Huh, <laughs> replied Sir Handel. What's that rubbish? I'm tired. Let Peter Sam go. He'd love it. Whatever next. Those aren't coaches, they're cattle trucks. Trucks? I won't, so there. Told you. Are you sure? This isn't like Mavis becoming a much nicer engine after her introduction in Series 3, because she had an arc where she became more responsible and saved another engine as a result of her mistakes. Sir Handel's thing was that he was always a prick. A clever message for audiences saying that sometimes you will meet people who, no matter how hard you try, will never change their selfish ways. Oh dear, whispered Scarlowy. He's worse than ever. And so it was always satisfying watching Sir Handel get his comeuppance. Every. Single. Time. This is just a completely bass backwards portrayal of him that only seeks to make him less interesting as a character. As for the other narrow gauge engine, you know what, fuck it, I don't want to talk about them because I'm just going to be repeating myself in my series 9 review. I'm just going to quick fire through their biggest moments in this series. Rusty is impatient and irresponsible, making the workmen rush putting signs up, leading to people getting confused. Reneus and Skarloey are silly kids who race dangerously down the mountain, leading to Reneus derailing and falling into the valley. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh god, Skarloey in particular is at his worst this time around, being not only afraid of going to the wharf, but complains about being tired out from his work, and is an ungrateful little whiny shit seeing all the sights Thomas takes him to see on their way to the repair yard. Peter Sam and Mighty Mac did nothing. Duncan, like before, feels like the only one of the narrow gauge engines who got the better treatment. 
while he too regresses into a child when he purposefully runs along a bumpy track to keep ringing a clock town bell he's delivering. Seriously, how does he not go deaf from all that ringing? Ring that bell for notifications, by the way. He's always on the scene, fireman Sam. But, once again, he got the best narrow gauge centric episode of the lot, and that was Duncan's Bluff. In this story, James and Duncan become very competitive over their work as a result of teasing each other. Can James deliver coal to the wharf faster than Duncan can deliver said coal before James gets back with more? As it turns out, no, but Duncan cheats his way into being ahead of James and so he ties himself out trying to keep up and ends up stranded out in the snow. Realising James will miss out on taking the children to a Christmas concert, Duncan owns up to his trick and without being told to do so, he takes one of the hidden coal trucks out to James and helps him be on time for his special job. I love this episode. I love how it plays on James and Duncan's dynamic of being as egocentric and competitive as each other, something we see started all the way back in series 4 when James gave Duncan bad advice on dealing with diesels as a result of boasting. So yeah, Duncan got it best out of the rest of the narrow gauge engines, but not without sin. As for the rest of the Steam team, well I'm happy to say Thomas doesn't feel as forced into this series this time around, as more time is given to the other main leads, but we still have issues. I'm also going to quickfire my way through these guys because it's more or less the same swings and roundabouts as in series 9, save for one which I'll leave until last. Percy's stupidity is at an all time low as he fails to remember simple instructions given to him by Lady Hat in the green controller. Toby wants an afternoon off and gets all whiny and miserable when his friends don't have time to help him get his jobs done. And I thought they were my friends, puffed Toby sadly. What a shitty little brat. Emily didn't do much this series, other than her one lead role where she chases Diesel who stole Gordon's special coaches. She's bitchy to him before he's even said or done anything, but I guess that's just the standard for all the steamies in the hit era now, as bad as that is. Henry, Gordon and James are more or less the same as they've always been, each taking part in at least one of series 10's best episodes and not really doing much else in other episodes. Yes, even James the second best, which I know a lot of you were expecting me to talk about, but by this point this was episode 27 and my brain had just checked out. I've nothing to really say about it. It's okay, I've, I've got nothing. And Thomas has the same inconsistency of being an accident prone impatient child, even more so than the last series being honest, and is still somehow the responsible voice of reason in other episodes. I'll give him this, I do like that there's an episode with him interacting with the narrow gauge engines where he is the one who makes a mistake, accidentally shunting a flatbed of what he thinks is a Christmas tree into the canal, and they're the responsible ones he has to ask for help. I just wish it was Skarloey or Reneus, not Sir Handel. I also find his teasing of James when he crashes into the billboard quite funny. You're finally in a poster, chuckled Thomas. Maybe you are good enough after all. Classic cheeky Thomas right there. But the character who got it worst of all in series 10, not even a contest, was Edward. And you all know which episode I'm talking about here. It's Edward Strikes Out. In this story, Rocky makes his grand arrival on Sodor, and Gordon is quick to disregard him as he can't move himself. Because cranes can totally move by themselves, right Gordon? And in a bizarre twist of fate, Edward, the one who would either tell other engines off for being silly, or simply disregard them to laugh at their stupidity, agrees with Gordon that Rocky is a newfangled nonsense. What? I don't need your help, sniffed Edward, newfangled nonsense. This leads to him being too caught up in thinking about Rocky's uselessness, and his train of pipes spill out onto the tracks. And rather than call for Rocky, he asks for Harvey to come and clear the mess, despite the fact he can only lift one pipe at a time. Only when Gordon hits the pipes and derails, does he finally realise only Rocky can fix this. Why does this feel like it was written for Thomas or James but got redrafted to be about Edward because he didn't have enough of a presence in this series? It was bad enough with Edward's warrior persona in the series prior, but having him be an arrogant snob just feels so… wrong. This is another one of the worst episodes of series 10, definitely. 
If you want to see this story done better, Brendan Productions did a great rewrite of this episode years ago. I won't spoil it, but in short, it portrays Edward's character miles better than here. Newfangled nonsense. Yeah. In all the empty, devoid of distance set designs that are commonly known to the hit era, even the returning Sodor airports feeling a tad lifeless, I can safely say there is one new set design in series 10 that I genuinely adore, and that is the wharf. <laughs> For one, it allows the large-scaled Thomas and the new large-scaled James, as creepy looking as they can be at points with those faces, to interact more with the narrow gauge engines without sticking to one place. In series 9, there was only one set that Thomas could talk to the narrow gauge engines from, and that was the transfer yards, which was just one stretch of track for Thomas and the rest of the tracks for the narrow gauge engines to just stand there and talk to him across the platform. Now there are narrow gauge tracks that run alongside the bigger ones, cross over each other at crossings, and ones that run into warehouses and sheds that are big enough for both engines to interact in. There's a lot more varied shots and possibilities for the bigger engines to interact with the smaller ones, and episodes like Thomas's Tricky Tree really show that off well. While the lack of hills or anything in the far background create the same lack of distance common to the hit series, the wharf set makes up for it, with the sheer size of the place. Again, this isn't just one restricted platform, it's a whole widespread area, with different industrial buildings and chimneys around the place, trucks standing on different tracks to create a sense of a busy, bustling workplace in a style akin to Series 2, a little bridge crossing a canal which itself is full of boats and has uniquely designed quayside cranes beside it, you can enter the wharf at the crossing, and it'd take a significant time to reach the far side of the place with the canal bridge. I don't think any set in Thomas and Friends has ever felt so big before, not just in the hit era. I also have no idea if the name The Wharf came from Tawin Wharf, given the Scarlowy Railway's connection to the Talican Railway. Probably not, considering they look nothing alike, but it's nice to think about the TV series, potentially, having another connection to real life railways. And that's it. That's all I have to say on the set designs. The rest are just the same as before. I mean, I guess there's the new brass models for the engines, slowly replacing the plastic ones as they're retired from regular use. But honestly, aside from the new faces, I didn't notice anything different about these props at all. Which I guess is a positive, as they don't feel like they're alienating audiences with radically different designs. But what else can I say? They're brass now. The Chinese dragon prop from Thomas Percy and the Dragon makes a return in Percy and the Carnival, that's cool. Sir Handel has an upscale model now, though I'm not a fan of that shade of blue or the faces he has. Speaking of faces, jeez Louise, what did they do to the new human faces? They all have massive pupils now, making their stares at the camera or the engines feel very unnerving. Lady Hat in particular, sheesh, she looks like she has weirdly sparkly anime eyes. Oh look, Scarlowy's O-Gage model makes an appearance in Thomas and Scarlowy's Big Day Out. That was cool seeing it again. They still seem to want to use the GoPro fisheye lens, it seems, on the rarest occasion. And it does feel like an awkward jump scare when it happens. Can you see how many straws I'm pulling out by this point? Going into this series, having just finished Jack in the Pack, I was disappointed to see the music take such a backseat. Many of the songs used in this are either repurposed for an entirely different context, or fail to stand out because they blend in with the same overuse of horns that used to be mostly associated with the narrow gauge engines, but now seems to be creeping its way into the bigger engine stories. I liked one song. Out of all 28 episodes, I at least remembered and enjoyed one. It's the one from Emily and the Special Coaches where she's chasing Diesel around the island. It's upbeat, catchy, and I like the use of what I think is a clarinet, but I'm not exactly sure. But hey, I can say that- <laughs> But hey! <laughs>
But hey, I can say those songs and music videos were a slight improvement. As little as that means if you watched series 10 without the supplementary material. Doing it right feels like a song ripped right out of the series 6 period of time, in a good way. H's for Harold is okay, but his song in series 5 is miles better. Fire that burns down the whole town! There's always something new is decent, but this lyric about the new characters is just a blatant lie. So that was a fucking lie. Navigation is quite catchy and is actually sung pretty well. Oh, hey, Duck. Favorite place, strength, and responsibility, they're just flat out okay. What else do you want me to say? They are hit era songs by Ed Welch, not Hans Zimmer. As for narration, again, going into this after Jack and the Pack, it's such a shame because now I'm beginning to notice more of the issues with Angelus' narration. His Scouse accents for characters like James and Percy are starting to get very... ear grating. There's no coal at the stations, he wished. We've all run out of coal. If the engines don't get some coal, the funfair won't open. All the children will be sad and it's all my fault. Honestly, it feels like at this point he's accepted his fate and given in to this bored, slightly played down to kids narration that the producers at HITS wanted him to stick with. Also, I noticed this one moment in Thomas and the Jet Plane where there's this awkward silence as Percy talks to Thomas. But engines can pull carriages and take children to picnics, Pete Percy. Engines are really useful. What what was that about? He's not awful. He definitely has his moments. And if you biff me, I'll biff you back. So there. Ooh, said the trucks, and they didn't move an inch. Once Henry had started them rolling, they wouldn't stop. Help! cried Henry. His voice for Gordon in particular is entertaining with how posh and proper he sounds. Put those trucks back, Gordon wished. Those are for Farmer McCall. I'm collecting them later. But overall, far from his best. Still, could be worse. Toby, you must pull Gordon's Express, he told him. Why? Clang, clang, boing, went the bell. I'm sorry, sir, he said sadly. I've spoilt your day. Oh, Brandon, I'm sure you meant well, but this... I'm tired. This ain't it, Chief. He at least had his standout moments, too. In some ways, he did a better job with an Angelus. I like the tired, panting for breath he did for Sir Handel after he struggled to climb the first hill. I have a problem, we Sir Handel sadly. It happens when I go up hills. I really enjoyed his voice for Fearless Freddy. I'll show you who's fastest, tooted Freddy. I'll race you down the mountain. And I chuckled at the noises he made for Henry's accident in Big Strong Henry. <laughs> that was good, but both narrators could be doing so much better. I originally wasn't going to do a bottom 5 and top 5 episodes for series 10, but I figured I have to be consistent, despite the fact that I missed it in the last video. So for anybody wondering, in the Jack of the Pack review, my favourite episode for that would be A Happy Day for Percy, and my least favourite would be Jack Owns Up. So here goes nothing, the worst episodes of series 10. Number 1. Almost all of the bloody Sharon Miller stories. Follow that flower, the green controller, Edward strikes out, topped off Thomas, and Thomas's goddamn frosty friend. They're all as bad as each other, with Thomas's frosty friend in particular taking the crown simply for stretching the three strikes formula to an even more insufferable five strikes. I say nearly all of her stories made to the bottom list, but I actually like Thomas's tricky tree a bit. What can I say? I love the wolf. Now for the top five. Number 5, Thomas's Tricky Tree. Again, I just really like the wharf. Number 4, Big Strong Henry. A fun Gordon and Henry story with one of my favourite characters getting to one-up Gordon with a nice callback to their incident with cows in series 2. Number 3, It's Good to be Gordon. The second fun-filled Gordon and Henry story that shows genuine growth for the Big Blue Express engine. 
and I don't fully despise the special call retcon here as it's used to tell a good story, which sounds weird but I don't care, I'm gonna roll with it. Number 2, Toby's New Shed, a genuinely sweet story with an important moral for audiences and a rare instance where Toby doesn't feel too far removed from his previous portrayal. And number 1, Duncan's Bluff, this has it all. James and Duncan's rivalry which reaches a wholesome ending, gorgeous shots of the wharf and the mountain lions covered in snow, and it just feels different compared to the rest of the stories. It deserves the crown. All five of these episodes do rank the same in some way, but it depends on how I'm feeling. Right now I'm in the mindset where Duncan's Bluff is my favourite, but give me a month or two and I'll probably be leaning more towards Toby's New Shed or It's Good To Be Gordon as my number one pick. At least there were still some diamonds in the rough. Series 10 is just more of what we've had so far, at such a base level of uninteresting, yet somehow finds ways to be worse. If it's not frustrating me with its ridiculous episode premises which either showcase these beloved characters as idiots or does a disservice to how they are meant to be represented, it's turning my brain off with repetitive visuals, such forgettable music, ear grating or just unenergetic narration, and incredibly simple morals that you guess before the episode even has a chance to begin. When more than 70, maybe 80% of these episodes were met with me breathing a sigh of exasperation when they ended, there's only so much investment I can provide. I may enjoy one of the new characters, I may adore the set created for the wharf, and I may find good, even great episodes sprinkled here and there, but right now, I just want out. As is, having watched this series fully for the first time in years, and right after the others with my current opinions and mindset, this is one series of Thomas and Friends I can quite happily skip. <sighs> I've no doubt made a lot of enemies from this review, and to that I reiterate from the beginning of this video, I am genuinely happy if you consider Series 10 to be one of your favourites. More power to you. You guys clearly see something that I don't, and that's fantastic, that's a special feeling that's unique to you. Don't feel like you have to change that because I spent however many minutes ranting about it. You keep on being who you are. If you do have any favourite things about Series 10, let me and everyone else know in the comments. I'll also admit that, yeah, this review video wasn't the biggest and best I've ever made, but don't worry. The next one is gonna be miles better.